hello. We are back with our sixth lesson in our series of Philemon, studying this book verse by verse, uh, really taking our time to dial in on this little letter, 25 verses. And we are taking 10 weeks to do this. We're calling it a primer on forgiveness. And really, that's what we find in this letter from Paul to Philemon. And as we've studied out this letter, where Paul is really addressing an issue that has occurred between two believers. It had originally occurred between an unbeliever and a believer, but now the offender has come to Christ, Onesimus, and Paul is trying to reconcile the two. And in this letter, we really have this beautiful plea for reconciliation to take place in the church. And this is so practical and so helpful for us. And as practical as it is, it is not without theology and it is not without gospel richness. And so we've been noticing as we've studied through this book just how packed this letter is with the beauty of Christ and the glories that we find in God's forgiving of us and how that helps us to forgive others. So I hope you've been enjoying this uh, series as much as I have. We began the series with the partners for forgiveness. We saw in the first few verses, Paul speaks to uh, the whole church and, and he ropes the entirety of the church into the matter of reconciliation between these two people. And then he moves on from that to the premise of forgiveness. And the premise of forgiveness is essentially, in a nutshell, it's Christ. But in more detail, he says that it's grace and peace in his greeting that comes from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've noticed that without the grace and peace that comes in salvation, there is no grace and peace to forgive. And so you must be forgiven by God if you ever will truly, biblically forgive others. And so we carry the premise with us. We've seen it, it's, it's woven throughout this letter that you need Christ and we need to keep coming back to the cross if we are ever going to truly forgive. We need the grace and the peace that comes from Christ and we need that to be a steady stream for us in order to be obedient in forgiving and reconciling with each other in the body of Christ. And from the premise, we move on carrying the premise with us to see the prayer for forgiveness. We spent two weeks on that. And we notice Paul's expectation of blessing and his expression of thanksgiving. But now we are in the heat of the plea for forgiveness. This spans from verse 8 all the way to verse 19. And we're going to split this into four lessons. Um, we spent the first week examining this plea, noticing the motive for forgiveness. And, and the motive is for love's sake. That's what Paul hopes Philemon will forgive Onesimus out of, is the, out of a, the sake of love or for the sake of love. And so we, we've spent time discussing that, but today we're going to discover two more aspects of Paul's plea. And we're going to see how we view believers that are needing our forgiveness and the goal of our reconciliation with those believers. And so with that, we have number two, number one, we saw the motive. Number two, though, we're going to see the mindset, the mindset. If I were to ask you, uh, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of somebody who has grievously wronged you? What is the first thing that comes to your mind most of the time? I don't imagine that your mind naturally goes to all the positives about that person, the redeeming qualities of that person. Um, maybe when you hear the name of someone who has wronged you and that name is mentioned, perhaps the feelings you feel are not all warm and fuzzy. Uh, the same could probably be said in the case of Philemon whenever he might have heard the name Onesimus leading up to this letter most likely at the mention of the name Onesimus, uh, perhaps the word thief is what came to his mind. Uh, perhaps thorn in the side is what he thought of when he thought of Onesimus, or maybe a, he was a headache. Perhaps he thought of betrayal. But Paul wants to make sure that Philemon has a right mindset about 
Onesimus. That in order to forgive Onesimus, Philemon, in a sense, has to have his mind recalibrated on who Onesimus is. And, and from verses 10 to 12, Paul provides not only the information to help Philemon see how precious Onesimus has become, he also provides the best news possible. Now, what is that? Well, that is that Onesimus is now a new creation in Christ. Onesimus is now born again. He is redeemed. He is a believer. He is in Christ. And, and this is the best news we get this entire letter. Uh, this is really a, a bright spot that we could call in this letter. It is one of the mountain peaks of the letter of Philemon to hear that this runaway slave is now a brother in Christ, is now somebody who has come to know Jesus as the same Lord as Philemon and as Paul and the remainder of the saints, the church. So let's see this in verse 10. He says, Paul does, I plead, that's parakaleo, that's, that's simply an appeal. I appeal, I plead with you. Notice what he calls Onesimus. I plead with you for my child, Onesimus. Now, for the first time, 10 verses into this letter, Onesimus' name is finally mentioned. He's been leading up to this the entire time. And if you actually were to look at this verse in the Greek, you'd notice Paul actually saves Onesimus' name for the very last word of that even statement, that verse. Paul is so strategic and so tactful in this letter that he, he eases his way in getting to the heart of the issue. And, and he doesn't even specify his plea until verse 17. We're going to see that in a couple weeks. So notice how, how purposefully Paul speaks positively about Onesimus. He calls Onesimus his child. Uh, Paul would commonly call those who he had led to Christ his children. Um, he calls Timothy in 1 Timothy 1-2 his child in the faith. He calls Titus in Titus 1-4 his child according to our common faith. He calls the Christians at the church in Galatia in Galatians 4-19. He calls them my children. Um, so Paul, what he's not saying here, he's not saying that he is the one who who gave birth to these believers, that he was the one who regenerated them, although he is alluding to the reality of the Spirit's work in regeneration. He is really uh, coining a term that was used by rabbis oftentimes whenever a proselyte came to Judaism. They would literally say whenever they won a convert to Judaism that a child has been born. And, and Paul borrows that terminology because of the affection that is so deeply rooted in that, and he uses it for himself to, to refer to those that he sees come to Christ through his ministry. He sees his converts in that sense as his children, that he is a sort of spiritual father to them. And, and here in, in the letter of Philemon, Paul is telling Philemon that one of his newest children in the faith just so happens to be Philemon's runaway slave. And it is Onesimus. And he makes this even more clear in the remainder of this verse. Notice, of whom I became a father in my chains. Somehow, by God's divine and gracious providence, we've, we've discussed this before, somehow Onesimus came into contact with an imprisoned Paul. There are several possibilities. Perhaps he had heard Paul's name uh, working around the house when he was with Philemon, and so he knew that Paul would be somebody that he could run to. How would he know that Paul was in Rome? I'm not sure. How would he, he know how to find him? I'm not sure. Really, all we can do is speculate as to how exactly God brought Philemon uh, into Paul's life and Paul into Philemon's life. But what we do know is that by God's providence, God had worked things out so that Philemon, or Onesimus rather, would come into contact with Paul and through that would come to faith in Christ. And Paul is making it clear here to Philemon that this thief, 
this offender, this, this man who has, has brought great, great hurt and pain to Philemon, is Paul's near and dear child in the faith. He's, it's almost like he's saying, hey, Philemon, your runaway slave is my child. Your offender is my beloved. That Onesimus is precious to me. That the one who has caused you pain is precious and near to my heart. Now, this is really amazing news, though. I mean, and if Onesimus was in the right, or if Philemon was in the right state of mind receiving this letter, then he would be rejoicing to know that the one who had run away from him has come back, and he's come back as a brother in Christ, which is what's spoken of later on in the letter. Receive Onesimus back no more as a slave, but as a brother in Christ, more than a slave, as your brother, a beloved brother. Onesimus it should not be seen anymore as a runaway slave. He should not be seen anymore as a thief. Onesimus should be seen as beloved, as precious. He is new. He is redeemed. He is a born-again believer, and he should be viewed as such. That is what Paul is getting across to Philemon here. And so in order to prove this to Philemon, in order to prove that genuine transformation has taken place and that Onesimus has truly come to faith in Christ, Paul wants Philemon to know that Onesimus is not the same man. He doesn't just claim to know Christ. There's proof, there's fruit that comes from that profession of faith. And so there's been a change in Onesimus, and Paul makes this known, and in making this known, he gets creative. And I want you to see what he does in verse 11. He, he uses a really smart play on words. Look at verse 11. Who formerly was useless to you. That Onesimus formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. Now this is significant when you come to know that Onesimus' name literally meant useful. That was the actual meaning of Onesimus' name. Back in the Greco-Roman times, Onesimus was a very common name given to slaves. And it was given for that purpose that they might be useful. And Onesimus was given this name. His name literally was useful. But in Philemon's household, he was not living up to his name. He was useless. In fact, he, he did more harm than he did good. And so he was once useless. But now, now that he's come to faith in Christ, now he's useful. Things are different. And he's useful not only to Paul, but to Paul and Philemon. So formerly, he was useless to you. But grace has made a change. And Paul says now he is useful to you and to me. And this was a spiritual play on Onesimus' earthly or physical offense. Onesimus caused physical loss for Philemon, but now he is spiritually profitable, fruitful, useful, hear me, to the kingdom of God. He now, where he was supposed to be useful in just an earthly sense, he far exceeds that now in a spiritual sense and is now useful in both senses. And so this is really a, a brilliant play on words by Paul. Uh, Paul uses the term useful in a gospel context for gospel usefulness uh, in 2 Timothy 2.1. And he, he says it like this, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from, from these things, that these things are, are dishonorable, sinful things, if anybody cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful for the master or to the master. This is how Paul uses the word in, in Philemon to describe Onesimus, that he was once akristos, useless, but now he is eukristos in Greek useful. He was in his old state, 
useless. But now, useless Onesimus, useless useful, literally, is now useful useful. He is now profitable, fruitful. He is not the same person that you once knew him to be. And is this not the the same truth of all of us who have come to know Christ? That at one time we were useless, useless to the kingdom of God, dead in our trespasses and sin. But because of the lavish grace of God and because of His mercy, He washed us with regeneration and gave us a heart to know Him, a heart to do His will, a heart to keep His commandments, a heart to seek after Him, a heart that is sorry for sin. He gave us a new heart with new desires and with those new desires, new hatreds of the things that God does not love. And because of that work of grace, where we once were useless, by God's grace, we have been made useful to His kingdom. And so we have this common bond with all believers, even the ones who've wronged us, that we all, we all are sinners deserving of nothing but wrath, but by God's grace, we've been brought nigh by Christ's blood, and we all have this common inheritance in Christ. And this really should shape the way that we see each other as Christ dwells in us. And Paul is saying, Onesimus does not just claim to be a believer, Philemon. He is a a believer. He is not the same. He is a new man. But we have to make a really important note here. We're going to deal with this in more detail in the weeks to come. A lot of people will ask me, "What, what do I do? Do I forgive if someone isn't sorry? And again, we're going to answer that question in more detail. But just for now, we have to understand something. Forgiveness Though it can be offered, and even in some levels, it can be granted to an offender. It cannot be fully realized unless the one who has wronged the offended is repentant. There has to be repentance if there will be a full revolution in reconciliation, if reconciliation will come to its its fruition. There has to be that repentance. And this was true of Onesimus. Onesimus was repentant of his sin. And one of the evidences of such is the fact that he is now back at Philemon's doorstep with this letter in his hand. So Onesimus is not the same. Onesimus has has repented of his sin and he's turned to Christ in faith. And this has been proven true by his life. So what Paul wants Philemon to know is that the Onesimus that is standing before him now, holding this letter, is not the same Onesimus he once knew. He's not the same man. And just in case the preciousness of Onesimus has not been clearly enough conveyed or communicated, verse 12, notice what Paul says even more so, I have sent him back to you in person, Onesimus. That is my very heart, heart splanchna. It literally is the same word we saw earlier, the bowels, the innermost part of a person. I've sent you my heart, the, the heart of hearts. I've sent him to you. He is my heart. I've sent Onesimus back to you. This is what Paul's saying. To receive Onesimus then is to receive my own heart. It's to say that the way that Philemon treats Onesimus should be equated to the way that Philemon would treat Paul's own heart. That you are handling my heart when you are handling Onesimus. That to unkindly or to rudely or harshly handle Onesimus was to do the same with Paul's heart. But to unhesitatingly receive Onesimus, it was to unhesitatingly receive Onesimus. Paul's heart. Do you get what he's saying here? Paul wants Philemon to see Onesimus, hear me, through the lens of love. He wants him to see him through the lens of love. And when we see our brothers and our sisters in Christ, even the ones who have wronged us, even the ones who have sinned against us, 
And especially when they repent of that, we are to view them the same way that God views them. They are forgiven. They are in Christ. They are on the same footing as you. You are not standing on higher ground than them in any way. They are redeemed. They are precious. Your offender, if they are in Christ, your offender is precious. Especially if they've repented of their sin against you. And if someone is precious in the sight of God, why should they not be precious to you? And if God has loved them when they did not love God, who are we to not love them now that they do love God? Do we know better than God? Will we quit on those that God is ever faithful to? Will we disown those that Christ shed his blood to purchase, to redeem? Will we give up on those that he calls his own? In my family, um, I've, I'm the oldest. I've got two siblings. I've got a younger brother and I have a younger sister. It would be a lie to say that we never fought growing up. But something that, that hasn't happened is that even now in our, in our adult lives, even when we disagree, and even when we might get upset with each other or even hurt each other, there's never a thought that comes to our minds, well, we'll just quit on each other. We'll just, we'll just be done with this relationship. We're just going to give up. Why? Because, well, they're family. I'm not just going to quit and throw in the towel on my own family because they've wronged me or they've hurt me. They're, they're my blood. Now, what are you getting at, Nick? Well, here's what I want you to just kind of sit on for a little bit. Um, in this day and age, and in the Western world, we live in a, a, a time where professing Christians will quit on the church like that. That's all, all it takes is one wrong. Or maybe they have a strike system, and three times I've had enough, I'm done. I'm not saying that there shouldn't be a certain point when people uh, realize that the church they are in is, is unhealthy and toxic and that the leadership is deeply flawed and unqualified. That, that's one thing. And we could talk about other reasons for, for quitting or leaving a church. I'm just talking about being wronged by somebody. So often people will just throw in the towel on their brothers and sisters in Christ, and they'll quit simply because of the harm that has been done. Maybe because they don't want to deal with the process of reconciliation because that is an awkward and difficult process to go through. Uh, other times it might just be the, their pride and they don't want to be offended by these people. To them, church is seen more as a, a club that they belong to. But, but my friends, church is not just this religious club. Church is a family. And Paul uses family terms to describe Philemon's offender. He wants Philemon to see the one who has wronged him as a brother in Christ. Paul was his spiritual father, Philemon. And he wants, to, he wants them to know they're brothers. They are brothers, him and Onesimus. They are family. And that they should be seen in the same way. Christ is all and he is in all. And so how we view each other is critical when it comes to reconciliation. Don't just quit on the church. Perhaps you're watching this and, and you might have been hurt by somebody else in the church. There's a biblical loving way to handle that rather than just give up and walk away. So I encourage you to recalibrate your mind and see your offenders the way that God sees them. But Paul, after laying out the motive and, and recalibrating Philemon's mindset, now he's going to set forth the mission. 
this is the end that he has in mind for this receptive forgiveness. Paul has called Onesimus both uh, to him and Philemon here. He has called him useful. He's useful both to you and to me. That's what Paul says. And now he's going to explain how that's true in verse 13. Notice verse 13. Who, Onesimus, I intended to keep with me so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. Uh, Paul informs Philemon of, of his preference for Onesimus. Here's what Paul really desires out of how Philemon treats Onesimus. We're not told exactly how, but, but Onesimus served Paul and he helped Paul's ministry when Paul was, was under house arrest in Rome. And Onesimus was faithful in helping Paul to advance the gospel in, in Paul's labors. Somehow, some way, maybe as a secretary, maybe as an assistant, we don't know. But he was helping Paul in the work of the gospel. And, and this is one of the ways he became so precious to Paul, so near and dear to his heart. And because Onesimus belonged to Philemon, he was, in essence, as he served Paul, he was by proxy serving Paul on Philemon's account. He was serving Paul in in Philemon's place. And this is how Onesimus Onesimus was useful both to Philemon and Paul. We could see Paul essentially saying this, Philemon, I know that you would give your right arm to help me in any way that you could. We're in two different places. We're separated by a great distance between Colossae and Rome. And if you were here, you would do anything to help me. And I know that you know well that my activity is limited from prison. And I had the thought, Paul is saying, that Onesimus serving me in the gospel could be a way that you could serve me through him, that you could vicariously help me serve alongside of me through your runaway slave, Onesimus. But, here, there's a but here, verse 14, this, this was my intention, this is my hope, but without your consent, I did not want to do anything. Paul is not presuming on Philemon's friendship. He's not just assuming that, well, Philemon would be okay with that, so I'm going to keep Onesimus with me and not send him back. No, he knows that would not be the right thing to do. And even elaborates on this verse 14, without your consent, I did not want to do anything so that your goodness, Agathos, would not be in effect by compulsion, but voluntary. You see that? A same motive again? that there are loose ends that had to be tied up before he could serve alongside of Onesimus. Paul hopes that Philemon would forgive Onesimus and thereby, in doing that, he would do what Paul had initially wanted from Onesimus, that Onesimus might serve with Paul again for the mission of the gospel. He doesn't want Philemon to send Onesimus back to serve with Paul because he was pressured to do so. He wants all of this to be out of his own willingness so that in reconciling with Onesimus, he not only would release Onesimus from the wrongs that he has done, but that he would free Onesimus, hear me, to serve. So more than implying that Onesimus should be freed from slavery, more than that, transcending beyond that, is the implication that Onesimus should be free to serve. That in this forgiveness, in this reconciliation, there is a restoration to service that takes place. That reconciliation, forgiveness, clears away hindrances in gospel labor. And here's the mission. Okay, so here's the mission behind this forgiveness. That the church would go forward that the gospel would go forward, that the kingdom of God would advance. That's the mission in this reconciliation, in this forgiveness. We have to really understand, we've talked about this prior in prior weeks, if we refuse to forgive, we will bring the work of the gospel to a screeching halt in the church. 
Perhaps this is no clearer scene than how it's seen in 2 Corinthians 2. Would you turn there, 2 Corinthians chapter 2? In this passage, Paul addresses an unspecified incident of someone who has caused hurt and sorrow in the church. He sinned. And the text makes it evident that the sin of this man has been handled by the church in loving church discipline. So it's already been addressed. And the man is apparently sorry for his sin. And notice what Paul says in verse 5 of, of 2 Corinthians 2. If any has caused sorrow, and we're going to read through to verse 7, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree, in order not to say too much, to all of you. Sufficient for such a one is this punishment. Meaning his punishment is enough that he is sorry for the hurt that he has caused in the church. So sufficient for such one is this punishment, which it was inflicted by the majority, so that on the contrary, you should rather, notice, graciously forgive and comfort him, lest such a one be swallowed up by excessive sorrow. He's makes it clear that if the church refused to forgive this repentant man, he would be katapino in the Greek, devoured, swallowed up by sorrow. That the church's refusal to forgive him would essentially paralyze him in sorrow. Notice verse 8. We'll read through verse 10. Therefore, I encourage you to reaffirm your love for him. For to this end also I wrote, so that I might know your proven character, whether you are obedient in all things. But one whom you graciously forgive anything, I graciously forgive also. For indeed, what I have graciously forgiven, if I have graciously forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ. So Paul reminds them that however they treat this offender, they do so in the presence of Christ, and that if Paul has forgiven them and Christ has forgiven them, they should forgive them. And notice what threat stands if they do not forgive. Verse 11, So that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. The devil schemes to ruin the work of the church in one avenue, one of many, and that is to cease any grace given or to really put up barriers for forgiveness, to dam up the mercy that we might show to each other, to, to give life to the bitterness we might hold against each other, to keep us from forgiving is one of the great footholds that Satan might get in the church, is to keep us from forgiving. The missional aim of forgiveness is freedom in gospel ministry. It is to continue the work without any obstacles it is to clear the way as much as possible for the church to go forward together, striving together, contending together for the faith of the gospel. This is at Paul's heart for the church. But when we don't forgive, we allow Satan a foothold in the church. And in doing so, it poses a threat to the work of the gospel. When there is no forgiveness... And even on the other hand, when there is no repentance for the wrongs that is done, the, the work of the gospel is tragically obstructed in the church. And so the motive that we have to forgive by is for the sake of love. The mindset that we have to maintain when we view each other, the ones who have wronged us, especially those who have wronged us and are repentant, is that they are precious in the sight of God and we must forgive them to the end that the kingdom would carry on, that the work of this church would not be halted by our pride or our ego or our grudges, but that God might be glorified as the gospel moves forward through the ministry of the church as we forgive. I pray that this is a help to you and as encouraging to you this passage of scripture in Philemon as it is to me. May we all forgive lavishly, 
and graciously as God has so forgiven us in Christ. Let's pray. Father, help us to forgive. Help us to have the right motive for doing so and help us to have the right mindset of each other in forgiveness. And as we see each other the way that we ought to, may we forgive so that your work would go forward. May we see what really is at stake when we harbor that bitterness in our hearts. Oh, Father, may we be mindful of Satan's devices, of his schemes against the church, that one of the ways he seeks to destroy the work of the gospel in the church is by by tearing the church apart from the inside out, by dividing the body of Christ. Oh, Father, may it not be so. May we forgive as you have so forgiven us. We thank you for these truths that we found in your word today. And we ask all of these things in the name of Christ. Amen.